Well, let me introduce you to Maggie Tenberg. Okay. She is a Roman archeologist and economic historian who graduated just last year from the University of Oxford, Oxford, England, where she did her PhD in classical archeology. span That sounds like a lot of fun to me. I think there's an archeologist somewhere hidden <laughs> underneath my early American history degree. Uh, her dissertation is Living Standards and Market Integration in the Rural Economy of Roman Britain. She is revising that dissertation into her first book to be published by the University of Michigan Press. She is currently a visiting assistant professor at Holt College, but she'll be starting a new position as an assistant professor of classics at Grand Valley State University in August. So your first tenure track job, yep. yes? Yep. Yes, wonderful. That's quite an accomplishment. She has worked on excavations and research projects in the United States, Romania, England, Greece, and Italy. A lot of those places, well, at least the last two are on my bucket list. I'll probably never get there, but Greece and Italy are on my list. One of her favorite things about excavating, aside from the old stuff and the smell of dirt, is bringing students into the field so they can learn hands-on skills and see the materials we talk about in class, which is always wonderful, actually, to introduce students to that. So midway through her dissertation, she moved to Holland with her husband, who just got tenure at Hope College. Congratulations to him. Um, and they have a four-year-old daughter. While they have yet to bring their daughter on an excavation, she will be going to Oxford, France, and the Netherlands with her parents this summer. I'm very envious of that little girl. <laughs> so, And so, without any further ado, take it away, Maggie. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you all here today. Um, everybody can hear me. Um, I'm awkwardly going to say this now, which I've told everyone I'm not going to say. I'm going to be chewing gum because my ears keep closing up because I had COVID two months ago. So if you hear me chewing gum and it's annoying, like raise your hand and flag me down and I'll take it out. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep it in so that I can hear you when you talk, which I hope you do. Um, I've just got this up for some laughs. <laughs> I taught a class on pseudo-archaeology in the fall, and I have one student that still says that aliens built the pyramid. Um, but seriously, well, I'm not sure how serious he is, but I think at least half of his brain thinks so. Um, so, you know, this is the introduction that she just gave. I'm just giving you a little picture of my life with the gratuitous photo of my daughter from last Christmas. Um, isn't she adorable. Amelia. We call her Mia. Um, and here, the my favorite excavation to ever be on here in England. Um, what I want to be talking with you about today, so next class, we're going to be talking about my research really, really in depth. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to people about this. Um, and I find it helps to kind of build up their understanding of the Roman economy a little bit um, and the Roman world before we jump into talking about like the pit in Roman Britain and all the pottery found in each pit, which I promise you by next week, you're gonna like it and you're gonna know why it matters. Um, but first today, we're gonna spend a lot of the class today just uh, talking about Rome a little bit. So some of you may know a lot about Rome. I'm assuming that most of you know a little, but not a lot. So we're just gonna do a really brief overview of Roman history. Uh, we're gonna talk about why I think it's important that we understand the Roman economy now. Um, even though it happened such a very, very long time ago. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Roman urbanism. So we're going to be comparing Roman urban centers with Roman rural economics next time. Uh, so to do that, you really need to understand something about the complexity of the Roman urban economy. Um, then I'm going to ask you to break into small groups. So look around at the people sitting around you. You're going to be talking to them a little bit. Uh, we're going to excavate our... Uh, 
maybe stereotypes, preconceptions, whether or not they're true or not, um, about rural populations in the modern world and in the ancient world. Um, this can be really funny. It's meant to be really funny. Um, so enjoy it while it lasts. Um, and then we're going to move on um, to talking a little bit about how we think about the kinds of data that we're going to be thinking about next time. Um, so in particular, I'm going to give you some maps and I'm going to ask you to read the maps and try to extract some of the information, um, some sort of deeper information from the maps than just like, where's this dot, right? Um, and we will finally be sort of wrapping things up and setting the stage for next week. Um, let's see. Here, yeah, that's it. So who has studied Rome in their education life? A, li a little, a lot, yeah. Um, where is Rome on this map? <laughs> yeah, right there in the middle, right? <laughs> so we, we're all happy with that. Um, I'm gonna give you a really, really, really fast, uh, like, travel through the history of this region here of the Mediterranean, okay? So Mediterranean Sea right here um, in the middle between Africa and Europe. Um, Italy here is uh, partially made of the African plate and partially made of the Eurasian plate here. And actually you find African soil on top of the Alps here as they smash together and they create this gigantic mountain range. Um, and everything underneath the Alps is really part of one big economic system in the ancient world. So we look at Africa and Europe and the Middle East as really different systems now. Um, but in the ancient world, they're part of one really, really big unified system. And we're gonna talk really briefly about the history of that system just quickly. Um, so we all know we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about like humans from the moment that they appear, but let's go back to about 12,000, 13,000 years ago. Um, most people around the Mediterranean, all people around the Mediterranean are living as hunter gatherers. So they're traveling in small bands, um, hunting meat and gathering fruits and vegetables and nuts and things like that. Um, living in very, very small groups of people. They're already sailing the Mediterranean at this point in these boats that look a little bit like this. I mean, we haven't found very many of them. They're found in uh, lakes. Um, and sometimes rivers. So they tend to be, you know, we know that they're taking sailing ships into the Mediterranean because we find trade goods, particularly obsidian, that only comes from a few different locations in the Mediterranean. And we find that obsidian all around the Mediterranean. So we know they're, they're trading, they're traveling, but they're living a nomadic lifestyle. Then um, in a wave that starts in Mesopotamia and continues all the way to the west, all the way to Spain, very slowly over thousands of years, people start settling down. You all, you know all of this. It begins in uh, the Fertile Crescent around 10,000 BC, um, where people start learning how to cultivate grain, um, and they settle down in villages where they're growing grain, um, and and they eventually also domesticate cattle. Um, and in around the Mediterranean, they figure out how to grow three major staple crops. And you need to remember these because we're gonna be talking about these when we talk about the rural economy again, okay? Staple crops, olives, wheat, and grapes. Now, if you think about um, why people might gravitate towards these three types of crops, do you have any ideas? Maybe talk about it with your partner just for a second, somebody sitting next to you. Um, these are all really tasty. But what makes them especially likely to take off in a Mediterranean agricultural environment? Climate? They can't. Yeah, so I'm hearing, okay, I'm hearing climate, trade, and you can trade them because why? Because the reason why they're so famous still today is because they're, they're, they keep really well and it's their preserved version of these, you preserve grapes into wine, right? Wine um, keeps really, really well. It's better if it's older, right? Um, and um, it's also very high calorie. That's why we're not supposed to drink too much of it, right? Um, very high calorie if you're, what? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Um, same with olives, right? Olives can be uh, turned into olive oil, 
really high calorie, keeps really, really well, goes rancid after about a year, but you've got a whole year to trade it in to save it. Um, and same thing with wheat, okay? High calorie, all these things that we're supposed to sort of avoid if we're on a diet, um, ancient people didn't avoid them because they needed all the calories and they needed the storage capacity. So we'll come back to talking about storage. You're going to be seeing a lot of this next week, these pictures here, um, but not right now. So we'll move on. Uh, people start living in villages, growing these crops. Um, and this village life slowly turns into urban life. Particularly here in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have the, the growth of very, very large cities of 10, 20, 50, 80,000 people, right? Um, and you're probably familiar with some of these, even if only through the History Channel or National Geographic, right? Um, we have the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Hittites, um, in, in Greece, also the Mycenaeans and the Minoans. So just to kind of jog your memory for this stuff. We have the growth of these large, powerful civilizations. Um, they start, these urban systems begin around 3500 BC, um, and they continue growing and growing and growing until all of a sudden, 1200 BC, they stop. Um, and here you can see all of those red crosses there. Um, these are cities that were destroyed either by fire or by some other kind of violent conflagration, right? between 1200 and 1150 BC. Yeah, it's called the Bronze Age Collapse. Um, this is something that maybe next year I'll give a talk about this. Um, it's really interesting, but Bronze Age Collapse. The Bronze Age Collapse. We don't know what caused it. There are people whose whole career is dedicated to figuring it out. Really interesting. Um, but this is where our Romans are gonna start to come in, okay? So the Bronze Age Collapse, uh, destroys this Eastern Mediterranean trade network. Um, and there's a dark age where everybody stops writing. We stop being able to find pottery that's dating to around 1200 to around 1000. We don't, we just have really a blank that scholars are starting to fill in right now. And in the wreckage of these large civilizations, some people groups begin um, trying to rebuild around 1000 BC people in Greece begin sending out colonists to colonize all around the Mediterranean. People here in Israel, Syria, um, start sending out colonists to colonize elsewhere in the Mediterranean. And eventually the Persian empire, so starting in Iran, but spreading all the way out even into Egypt, um, they very slowly, so around, around 550 BC, they spread out as well. It happens. <laughs> um, and it's in this sort of the wreckage of the Bronze Age that the Romans start to live here in Italy. And you can see here, Italy is a really great location if you want to become a powerful state in the Mediterranean. It's right, like right smack in the middle of the Mediterranean, um, in the middle between the East and West, in the middle between the North and South. Um, the Italian peninsula protected by the Alps. So there's a lot of warfare, but less warfare maybe uh, than there would have been. Um, and because of the, the long period of dark ages after the Bronze Age collapse, there's kind of a little space for new things to kind of pop up. And one of the new things that pops up is the Romans eventually over time, but they're popping up in a world that's now becoming hotly contested between the Greeks, the Phoenicians, and a group up here called the Etruscans in the green. So now we're going to focus in on Italy for a couple minutes. And we're going to say the people that lived in Rome, before it was ever called Rome, they moved there around 1200 or, or maybe 1000 BC. We're not sure exactly when. And actually, just less than a month ago, uh, a new work was published saying that all of our dates are wrong, showing car good new carbon-14 dating, showing that the pottery dates for all of this time period are, are wrong. So I really don't know. We, I especially don't know what the date is right now. Um, so people start living in uh, the location of Rome around 1000 BC. Um, and they're just living in little huts on hilltops um, right above a swamp that was a malaria swamp until 100 years ago. Um, and over about 
500 years, they congeal into an urban system, right? Um, they, be they begin to call themselves Roman. They begin building monuments. They develop um, a government system that I think you're probably all familiar with. You know, the Romans have a republic in the beginning um, and the republic is governed by a senate and consuls and there's it's it's sort of democratic there's voting right and um, and this republic goes to war very 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 frequently with its neighbors as all iron age societies of the mediterranean did they're constantly at war what makes the romans so successful not only that they're really good at fighting which they are really good at fighting but they're especially really good at making peace um most iron age civilizations when they fight and they win a war they'll go sack the city that they just beat and um, take its citizens as slaves um, and, and take as much loot as they could, right? Uh, what the Romans figured out that they could do was just say, hey, okay, we won. Go back to your city. We're going to be, you know, we're going to have a lot of clemencia. We're going to be very kind to you. Um, we're not going to attack you. Go back to your cities. But anytime we go to war with anyone else, uh, you need to provide your soldiers for our army. If you can imagine, like the Roman army just starts out just the same size as every other city state um, and becomes very slowly like the very, very biggest army that the world had ever seen. Um, and when it when it's, you know, it, it imagine if Holland conquered Zealand. Right. And then we, we get all the men of Zealand in our army and then we conquer Grand Rapids with the Zealand army and, and our army. And then we, we can move over and conquer the Detroit army. And pretty soon we have an army made up of all of Michigan and we're unbeatable, right? Uh, that's what happens with the Romans. So the Romans, they conquer all of Italy um, doing this. Um, and then they slowly start to move outwards. The Romans would say, oh, we're not, we're not moving outwards on purpose. Uh, people just keep pulling us into wars. And, and everyone else is going to say, well, it's not entirely true, okay? Um, here we can just, yeah, we can keep looking at it for a minute. So by 31 BC, this Roman Republic had started to eat itself alive. Um, if you imagine like the, the city council of Holland trying to rule all of America, it doesn't, it didn't work very well. Um, and and there was a whole um, a century of civil war starting in 133 BC, ending in 31 BC. And in the end, one person took control and became an emperor. Um, and the reason why we talk about the Roman Empire is not just that the Romans uh, conquered all of the Mediterranean and then Europe up to the boundary between England and Scotland, right? And you see, well, you will see it again in a second. Um, but also because it was run from 31 BC on by a single person, an emperor, okay? And that's uh, where this picture comes in, okay? Um, so ruled from the center at Rome, um, run by a bureaucracy of state functionaries and armies um, that were interested in exploiting the provinces, so all of the places conquered, for their economic wealth, and also interested in keeping their people as happy as possible, okay? Um, so all of the provinces become what we call, and this is something that we fight about a lot. So my supervisor at Oxford once yelled angrily about somebody else's definition of this term at a, at a street light. Well, I, well, we waited for the street light to turn like for 10 minutes, it turned five times. Um, and he's just screaming at me. And then, so Romanization is what, what I'm talking about. These provinces become Romanized meaning the people in the provinces start to dress like Romans more and more and more often. They start to speak the Roman language, which is Latin. So Latin in the West, Greek and Latin in the East near Greece. Okay. Um, people start living in Roman style houses. Uh, they start using Roman money. Um, that does not mean that they become just carbon copies of Italians, but it means that everywhere in this empire people become more and more and more alike okay and so we can really like from about the year zero until the roman empire falls apart in ad 476 we can really kind of say the whole thing is roman it might be britain is romano british so there are native elements there it's not like everybody's just italian 
Um, but we can talk about the Roman economy in Britain, the Roman economy in Italy, the Roman economy in Greece. And we're talking about relatively similar things. Okay. And we're going to complicate this as we go on today and as we go on next Thursday. But this is the basic picture. Okay. Do we have questions about this sort of like fastest history of the Roman Empire that I've ever given? Yes. Um, <laughs> is it a, oh there we go the greek empire before after where before where, i thought so okay so, so the greek empire has fallen they're not really an empire so greek city states they're not ever unified um they begin around the same time that rome does they start to form cities so around a thousand to nine hundred and our dates are changing now um and the time period that you're thinking of like the classical period with the parthenon and Plato and Aristotle, that's happening from around 550 to around 350 is sort of that. Alexander the Great starts in the 300 and then, and he forms this large empire, right? He dies in 323 and that empire eats itself alive. He says on his deathbed, they say, who should, who should succeed you? He goes, the strongest. <laughs> Not the way to ensure peace in your empire. If any of you are planning on imperial expansion, don't, don't do that. <laughs> With the changing dates, are they going backwards or forwards? So they start, okay, if we start 1000 BC, we go 1,900, 800, 700, 600, 500, 400. And then at zero, we go zero, one, two, three, four. Does that make sense? Is that answering your question? What? Oh, this date. Okay. Um, yeah, it's going forwards and then it starts over. So the map is starting. When does it start? Yeah, now we're 140 AD. Yeah, sure. I'm yeah. asking about the carbon dating and if the thing oh. was a thousand oh. BC, now is it five million BC or yeah, so it's years gone ago. backwards, which is what we all thought. Okay. So like They've been saying that the Greek geometric period ends in 735, that the, the final geometric period sort of around 735 BC. Now they're saying maybe 935. So it's back, which is what makes us all really happy. So the dark ages being shorter than what people have been saying for a long time and urbanization starting way earlier than people had thought. Um, but this is just one deposit with one carbon date from one island. So, and it's gonna, every archeologist date their sites on a mixture of um, absolute dates. So things that come from carbon dating and relative dates, things that come from pottery and stuff like that. And most of the Mediterranean pottery is dated um, now wrong. And all the sites that are dated based on pottery now have to be re, I don't know, reanalyzed. So they're all probably older, but they but we'd have to look at each site and the reason for the dating of each site to know. And this is something that actually like one of the few things that AI might actually be useful for um, <laughs> would be feeding all that pottery in and just saying, fix this for us, please. Yeah, someone. Just a quick question. Yeah. Do you have any idea of where the Romans originally came from? They seem to be native to Italy and native um, there already when this start happening, but everybody migrating in at various points, this population probably migrating in around 2500 BC from the Eurasian steppe, probably. Yeah, but the genetic research on this is pretty in its infancy. Yeah. You mentioned that the dates are changing. Yeah. And at first I thought, oh, no, more political opinion. But <laughs> you did say there's been advances in carbon-14 dating. Yeah. Could you spend a minute saying what those are at a high level? Well, it's not really, it, it's not technical advances, actually. It's just um, people being willing to spend more money doing carbon-14 dating of their site is the main advance that I'm talking about right now. So um, it's very expensive. It costs about 1,000 to 2,000 pounds to run a single sample at the Oxford lab, for instance. That's the only one whose prices I know. Um, 
And so archaeological programs, they tend to be on a sh shoestring budget and people want to do a lot of testing, but can't. And on this site, they had the funding to test um, really, really extensively. Um, and so they, they have these new dates. So that's the main, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get to um, I'm just fascinated by this map because it puts things in a timeline that I hadn't really appreciated before. Yeah. And the thing that's really interesting to me is how briefly the Romans held Britain. I mean, it, it was not a long time. No. Um, and how much they left behind in that short time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's really it's kind of shocking. Like, I'm going to tell you in a couple minutes, the Romans are a very, very long lasting empire, but the huge Roman empire that we see in that one little period is not very long lasting at all. About as long lasting as the U S right. Even, even less in some places. Uh, Romans only have Romania for about a hundred years, maybe 150 in parts of it, but yeah. All right. So we'll move on. Um, so here we can see it like crystallizes here, and this is Rome at its greatest extent, okay? Um, now, I'm going to really, really quickly talk to you about how we learn about the Romans, okay? So there are three major ways that we can study Romans. Um, and here, yeah, you can enjoy the little meme. Uh, only one, it's, it's actually one to three percent of all the literature that we think was written in the Roman period uh, survives today. Um, so how do we study the Romans? Well, we can use the ancient literature that does survive. And I'm going to move to this next slide for a second to show you how that happened. So ancient population um, in the Mediterranean wrote on papyrus and wood primarily, really, really thin pieces of wood. And papyrus, you know what papyrus is? Okay, the reed that grows along the banks of the Nile in Egypt can be made into paper. Um, and people would write on it and then roll it up into scrolls and you read the scrolls. Um, and papyrus survives very, very well in a Mediterranean climate, but it's not a perfect situation. Um, and you can see this one survived all the way up until now in Egypt, Egypt very, very dry. Um, so people would write on papyrus and put it in a library. And then in the Middle Ages, after the fall of Rome, um, people living in monasteries Notice that all of this literature was starting to decay and fall apart um, and began copying it um, in what's called scriptoria. So little like writing rooms. And here you can see they copy it and recopy it and recopy it. It, it was a very, very expensive process because they weren't copying it on papyrus and they had not developed paper yet in Europe. Paper comes from China originally, and it doesn't happen until after the end of the Middle Ages, really. Like Europeans don't start using it widely until the very end of the Middle Ages. So what they're using instead um, is vellum, which is it's calf skin or sheep skin uh, that's been cut very, very, very thinly and dried and stretched. Um, and imagine, like, you know how much a cow costs today? Somewhere between $1,000 and $10,000, right? Um, for one cow, right? So, and and you get several really large sheets of vellum from a cow. Um, and then with that, on that vellum, you have to spend all the time tanning it, you know, um, preparing it. Then you also have to have pigment. So in the medieval period, everybody's writing everything by hand. So they, since they're doing it by hand, they wanna make it beautiful. It's a really time consuming. And they use all of these beautiful pigments, some of which come from the local area, you know, from plants or from, local uh, geology, um, but some of them are actually traded from as far away as Afghanistan. Um, and there's a big pigment trade in the early medieval period. And then they would have to copy the work. So here we see, this is the earliest surviving um, Vulgate, so like Latin Bible, full Bible. Um, it's called the Codex Amiatinus. It's a thousand, over a thousand pages long. It's made from 515 calf skin, okay? Um, this is from the Codex Amiatinus, this one. And these are from different books, but just to show you what uh, the illumination, the drawings look like. This is back to the Codex Amiatinus. This is how big it is. 
So it's estimated to have taken uh, the scribe 10 years uh, to copy it. It's in England. I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> if you if you write it down for me, I will find it and I'll tell you at the, at the beginning of class next time. I used to know, um, but I forgot. <laughs> well, <laughs> so if you have to do this, to make a Bible. Imagine like uh, most churches wouldn't even have a single Bible because they couldn't afford it. It would have been costing between 500,000 and a million dollars in today's money to have one single Bible, right? So most priests didn't even know how to read because they didn't have access to books, um, let alone Bible, right? So if it's this expensive just to make a Bible, think about how, um, what sort of the cost benefit ratio analysis would be on copying random works of ancient literature or random works of ancient, you know, ancient letters, things like that. You wouldn't copy them unless you considered them extremely, extremely important, which is why we only have about 1% of all ancient literature surviving, okay? Um, so how else do we study the Romans? We do have some things that have been transmitted and survived. Um, we also can find stuff that we didn't know that wasn't preserved. Um, by medieval copyists, but that survived anyway. So we can we can study writing that made it, you know, living in the dirt, living in the sand up till now. Um, papyri, little bits of wood. Um, we can study inscriptions on buildings. We can study coin. Um, and then how else do we study the Romans? Well, through archaeology. So everybody know what archaeology is. I'm assuming, I sometimes I have really young students that don't know. <laughs> But I would assume that this group knows, right? Um, archaeology is just the study of the surviving material remains of the past, right? Um, and, and you know, archaeology would be studying the papyri, also studying the pit, right? Or the, the standing structures, art that's been passed down for generations. The main way that we get archaeological data is through excavating um, and looking at other people's excavations that have been published, okay? So, and you all know excavate how excavation works. We're going to look at some pictures of excavation a little bit later. Um, so our archaeological record, this record, the literature doesn't really change very much, but the archaeological record is constantly changing, particularly in places like England. And I'm going to show you a map in a couple minutes um, demonstrating how much excavation has been happening in England over the past 30, 40 years. And you'll see our picture is completely different than it was even, even 10 years ago let alone 50 years ago. So that's the material that we're going to be looking at next time, okay? Um, now, I'm going to make a plug. I think I think you're all interested in this, but I'm, I have to do this with my students. I, I have to teach my students why it's important to study the Romans, okay? And, I, and I'm just going to do that right now really quickly. Um, so this empire, you've seen how big it is. It covered uh, 5 million kilometers squared at its greatest extent, okay? It was populated by 70 million people. Rome, as a, a political unit, survived for between 1,500 and 2,500 years. If you count the Byzantine Empire, it's 2,500. The Byzantines called themselves the Kingdom of Rome. So that's why I include them here. Um, go forward. There. Um, and the Romans, as you all know, um, has, have had a really, really outsized influence on the modern world, right? So if you drive anywhere in Europe, um, you're either in former Rome or outside in the barbarian land. Um, and they speak different languages in Rome versus in the barbarian land. My husband is Dutch um, and his dad, we always would fly into the Netherlands. We often actually fly into Belgium and then drive north because it's cheaper, right? And we fly into the French speaking area in Belgium and then we drive north and we we slowly cross this linguistic boundary where suddenly all the signs are in Dutch. Um, and I always cry because I'm like, this is the same. This is the border of the Roman Empire. It's 100 miles south from where it was, the linguistic boundary, 100 miles south from the, the, the literal boundary of Rome. But it's still preserved there in the language, right? It's really, really interesting. Um, and this linguistic uh, boundary has, you know, the, the colonists that were colon, you know, people that were colonized by the Romans started to speak Latin and the people that were colonized by the people that were colonized by the Romans 
now speak Romance languages. So we have 900 million people in the world today speaking a language derived from Latin, right? Um, if you count English and 60% of our language is derived from Latin, uh, that's a third of the world's population, okay? So it's important to study the Romans just because so much of our cultural DNA comes from them, even just in, in language, right? Um, Rome, the context where Christianity grew up, as we all know, um, so much of our, you know, the, the politics of our world today and also the history of our world from the fall of Rome until now uh, is really related to Christianity, right? So we have to understand the Romans to understand that. Um, and then, of course, um, Roman patterns and, and thinking about social organization, about law, about literature and art and the economy, architecture um, and, and government uh, are modeled on or taken from Rome, okay? And none of this is why I study the Romans. <laughs> none of this. So I am really interested in systems, how systems work together, big systems. Um, and the Romans, I don't know um, if any of you have ever been on an excavation anywhere. Probably not. You can. Uh, if, when we we're, I'm going to start running one, I think, from GVSU, and I will be looking for volunteers. And I love working with retirees because they make the most interesting and the most hardworking of all the volunteers that I've ever worked with. So <laughs> you <laughs> depends on what you do. <laughs> um, <laughs> depends on what you do. There, there are ways around it. Um, I have a bad knee. I don't always, I don't always know when I, excavate. anyway, um, so anywhere you dig in Europe that, that was inhabited by the Romans, you're going to find Roman pottery, Roman coins, Roman everything, right? So we have a lot of data from the Romans. If we want to study like a really large system and how it works, particularly a really large economic system, we have the most data from any period in history from the Romans, right? So that's one reason why I study them. Another reason is that they have, uh, the single largest, most powerful economy in history until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is something that my advisor has been pioneering on, right? So uh, working with the Oxford Roman Economy Project, uh, doing research into lead pollution in Greenland, right? Um, working with people that are looking at pollution today, but going all the way back to the Roman period, you can see this peak in lead pollution. Lead is a byproduct of silver mining in the Roman world. Um, and you can see this gigantic peak in lead pollution seen in the Greenland ice caps um, dated to the height of the Roman Empire because the Romans are mining so much and they're making such a mess out of it. I mean, it's it's great. They're making the, all these coins, right? Um, and they have this gigantic impact on, um, you know, on the Greenland ice sheets and on the world at large, right? Why is the economy of the Roman world so powerful? Well, it's partly because it's, a very, very large area that's unified, right? Under single institutions, one legal system, a single currency, a road system that's connecting 50 million, uh, no, 50,000 miles of paved road, right? Um, very, very large scale exploitation of resources around the empire to pay for the Roman army um, and to pay for and support the large cities. And we're gonna look at large cities in just a second, okay? Uh, we also have high volume trade outside of this big system. So a very high volume trade with India, very high volume trade with less high volume than with India, with China, right? Um, so, okay. The Romans, as they start conquering, they have to build cities, okay? Because they need to administer their new provinces. And... Um, and because they think that you can't really be a human unless you live in a city. That's where we get our word civilization from the Latin word for the citizen of a city state. Okay. Um, and they'd say like, you have to go to the bath to be a real person, right? Um, you have to get an education. You have to go out for dinner parties. You have to talk and like exercise your mind. So you have to live in a city. Um, so the administrators going out to administer the provinces needed cities to live in. So the Romans build all of these urban centers and they become interconnected in one big economic web, okay? And these are just some of cities, some of the cities founded by the Romans. Um, by the time we get to about AD 100, 
here's here's a map of all of the known settlements in the Roman world. Yes. Um, okay. They don't conquer. Um, Vikings aren't there yet. They, this is something that my husband works on. So um, they seem to have not really had an interest in continuing to expand. It's quote, well, that's exactly. So he's working on a, on um, one of the things that he works on is, is a work by the Roman author Tacitus uh, about the Germans. And Tacitus says about the Germans, well, it's cold and it's damp and they fight with each other all the time. And they're really good warriors and they're they're the brain doesn't grow very well there and all they have is cows and we don't really like dairy that much <laughs> you know so like we want our olive oil not butter so uh it's not really worth it to conquer so that's our that sort of where the scholarship is now on why they don't continue moving north um so this is all the settlements this is the cities and the the size of the cities okay so Rome is an empire of cities. And we know the very, very most about Roman cities rather than knowing anything really about the Roman countryside um, because the Romans build so many cities partly and because there's so much amazing archaeology in these Roman cities um, that it's easy to get distracted and not look, at, look outside of them. Um, I'll let people take their picture. Here. So... And we're going to stay with the population in the cities for a second. But here I'm just drawing your attention. We have a population of 70 million um, divided amongst about 2,000 urban centers, with some of these urban centers being incredibly large. Anyone know how large Rome was? About 1 million to 1.4 million in the first century AD. And it's hard to estimate population size, right? Um, but even so, we think about 70 to 90% of the Roman population did not live in cities. We think they lived in the countryside. And we don't actually have good data on that. This is just what we think based on comparative data with later populations, right? So this could be wrong. Um, in these cities, Roman cities, they're not all exactly alike but they're very, very, very well organized. This is a city that was built in AD 100 and it was abandoned after the fall of Rome. So we can still see exactly what it looked like. And you can see super, super uh, rectangular little street blocks. Well, actually no, square. Um, these main streets connecting uh, all of the housing with a forum and a theater. Um, all of these large cities are um, given beautiful public amenities. You can see some of them. I heard somebody talking about bath or bath. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't do it in the right accent. Um, but that's the Roman, the surviving Roman bath in bath. Um, this is a Roman bath in Rome. It's now a church, but it preserves actually the original marble fitting. Um, a Roman what? The Baths of Diocletian, exactly. Yeah, you all know the Colosseum, the Pantheon. Um, and this is the theater at Palmyra in the middle, right? So uh, Roman urban dwellers really expected um, to have entertainment provided to them. And it was really uh, necessary for the, for the stability of the state, um, for the wealthier members of society to provide that entertainment for people, right? Um, we, we learn a lot about the workings of Roman urban systems, partly just from looking at cities like, like Rome, right, where we can dig down and find information about the Roman period. Um, but one of the things that I, I worked in Pompeii, and I, I really like studying Pompeii, um, because it preserves the whole urban fabric, not just the wealthiest houses, but the homes of the regular people too, okay? And I'm just, I'm not going to, I mean, this isn't a class on urbanism in Pompeii. I wish, I mean, I... Maybe one day I'll do one, but, but not right now. So I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures just so because I want those of you that haven't spent a lot of time looking at these things online, uh, just to have a picture of like, what does a Roman city look like? How does it function? So this is an aerial view of Pompeii. And you all know, how did Pompeii get preserved? Volcanic eruption, 8079, right? Vesuvius. That's what it looks like today. Yeah. Hasn't been fully excavated. So this part here 
is still the city, but unexcavated portion. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing Mussolini did a great job uh, paying for the excavation of large area areas in Pompeii. Um, not on this slideshow, but if you write it down, I will do it. So here you can see like it's it's surprisingly modern looking amenities with a sidewalk and there's a uh, underground piping for water. There's actually no sewer system in Pompeii just because it's right on top of a big volcanic deposit. But in most Roman cities, they're really well functioning sewers, um, not as well functioning as ours, obviously. Uh, there's fast food joints. And we know most people living in apartments wouldn't have kitchen um, in the apartment, so they would eat fast food almost every day. Um, many people, not everybody, uh, lived in houses. These are the nicest, the prettiest pictures that I could find, not not the most typical, okay? Just pretty pictures. Um, but this is Roman housing, very, very comfortable, um, nicely decorated. Even in apartments, we're gonna assume that there's wall painting, house it, rooms are smaller, but um, sort of basic layout of there being a common area for eating and working and then bedroom areas. All of that exists in the upper story apartments that survive, although we don't have very many of them. Um, we have outside of Pompeii, also villas, little like rural establishments, farm establishments here and here that are also really nicely, beautifully decorated. Um, this is a reproduction of a house that was found in Pompeii. This is now the Getty Villa, right? So in California, but um, it's a it's a perfect reconstruction of the Roman villa. Beautiful art. Um, so that one is mosaic. These are paintings, these three diagonally, um, and that obviously sculpture. You know, the mosaics are amazing. You go into the Naples Archaeological Museum and you can just get lost looking at these mosaics. Um, so they're beautiful. And most of what you probably know about Roman cities is this kind of beautiful, flashy stuff. The thing that I get really excited about about Roman cities is this stuff. So how are they supplied? <laughs> yeah, the sewers, the water, um, the, the factories, that kind of thing. So I'm really excited about it. Um, a, a city the size of Rome needed to supply itself with over 11 billion gallons of water a year just for basic drinking and basic washing, like if you were washing in a basin, okay? And you know the Romans have these gigantic baths, and they also use water for other things that we're going to see in a second. Um, and so they need a lot more water than that. Um, humans, a, a million humans produce about 320 million pounds of solid human waste a year which is not something that you could live with in your city. So Romans have to deal with that. Um, and one of the ways that they deal with that is uh, using it as fertilizer. Um, they sort of, but it not well enough to kill the parasites, which is recent studies come out, have come out showing that almost every human in the Roman world had parasites. So unsurprising. Um, and they needed 650 a uh, million pounds of grain a year um, at a minimum, right? The very, very, very bare minimum. So there is an extremely, extremely complex um, and, and very, very, very advanced system of supply that's operating in the Roman world. And this is what we're arguing about when we're gonna be talking next time about what's happening in the rural world. We see here, like a lot of the, the food and the water have to be supplied from outside the city, right? And who's supplying it? And under what conditions are they supplying it? That's that's kind of the, the question that we have. Um, this is just an example of the kinds of technologies that are being used to supply the Roman city. So we have things like aqueducts, the only really safe way to provide enough water for people. You can't dig well in a city and expect them not to be contaminated very quickly or dry up. Um, so you have to do things like this. Um, we have complex, I mean, relatively complex technologies for waste removal. Um, and we have a very complex food supply system. 
um, where we have grain shipped from all around the empire to these large cities. Okay, okay. Um, grown in North Africa, in Spain, um, and all around, uh, shipped to the large cities in ships, offloaded um, at docks in big port cities, stored in large, large warehouses. Um, the grain then needed to be ground into flour. You don't ship flour because it turns into paste if it gets wet. Um, and the, the traditional way that Romans would grind grain is with a little hand kern thing. Um, and then they develop things like this, animal-powered mills. But then uh, as the cities get larger and larger, they also develop water milling technology. Yeah, it was really incredible. Um, and then something that I didn't put into the slideshow because I get so excited, I wind up talking about it forever, um, <laughs> is we also have sort of uh, pseudo little factories for producing bread for sale at, in really, really large quantities. Um, so, um, and then it, on your bread or with your bread, you need to have oil, you need fats to survive, right? And also olive oil is used for many, many other things in addition to food in the Roman world, particularly lighting. So Romans light their houses with oil lamps and olive oil. Um, and, you know, most of most of the area that's really good for producing olive oil today um, also produced olive oil in the Roman period. Um, so a lot of southern Spain was turned over to olive growing, a lot of North Africa. Um, and uh, this is just an illustration of the huge amount of import of olive oil into the city of Rome. If you see this mountain, it's not really a mountain, it's really a hill. It's called Monte Testaccio, Broken Pot Mountain. It contains, uh, it's entirely made of broken olive oil and free. 53 million is the estimate. They obviously haven't counted them all, right? They're still there. <laughs> they take samples, dig all the way down to the bottom, say it's probably this many, right? Um, so 6 billion uh, liters of olive oil imported in about 150 years uh, to the city of Rome. Um, mainly from one region, just one area in southern Spain. Okay, so does this give you a picture of the complexity of the Roman economy in the urban centers? Just by necessity, we have to have um, a huge amount of production of goods in the countryside and an extremely, extremely complex um, redistribution redistrib system, getting things from the countryside into the city, okay? Um, but we don't tend to talk about the rural population very much. So I have also not, I haven't talked about the rural population yet, right? Um, partly to set the stage, but also um, partly because we know relatively little about them. This is a map, okay? showing um, farm sites with olive oil presses um, in Southern Spain, okay? And you can see there are some really big triangles and there are some smaller little dots. Um, we know a lot about the big triangles. So people, when they're excavating, when they're trying to get money to excavate, um, it's really easy to say to somebody, look, I have a villa, I'm gonna find some mosaics. I really need like $50,000. <laughs> Give it to me. Um, and somebody is going to tell you, yes, yeah, sure, here's the money. Um, if you were to say, I want to go do a survey and then excavate all of the little small farms in this area, and I need $200,000 to do it because I need more people than I need to excavate a villa, nobody's going to give you the money. <laughs> um, and nobody's going to be excited to see the results because everybody's going to assume where they're just going to find mud huts. It's just peasants, just peasants, right? We don't really care about them and we kind of know about them already, right? We know peasants, right? Um, were you raising your hand? Okay. So we know, okay, so the biggest settlements, aside their towns, right? Their cities, their towns, kind of know relatively little about villages. So I'm going to leave them out until next time. Uh, we know the next biggest thing other than a town is a villa. You all know the word villa is still used in the modern English. Um, in the Roman period is used to talk about a really, really big farm. 
and usually means a really, really big farm owned by a rich person, but not always. Um, and so many of these have been excavated. So here are some reconstruction of some of them. Uh, they'll have ornate, beautifully decorated houses, but also large productive facilities for producing things like olive oil or grain or beer. In Britain, it's beer oftentimes. Um, in Italy, olive oil and grain. Um, they might be manned by hundreds of slaves that live in slave quarters. If you look here to P, no, P is the pig's die, Q is the slave quarters. <laughs> um, slaves come from uh, Roman conquest. So the war booty and conquest might be um, 10,000 people in addition to the money that's gotten. As Rome starts expanding, it sometimes takes slaves in addition to making people into provincial population. Um, so another example. Uh, what about everybody else? Okay. Um, when I started working on my thesis, I was just really angry. I had worked as a newspaper reporter for a few years after college. Um, and I kept encountering things in my reading about the Roman economy that would just talk about the cities and not say anything at all about rural people, except to talk about villas and then to say, well, and then they had tenants, probably they had tenants. Um, and, and the tenants probably lived miserable lives. And that was it. That was all that they would say. And I just found myself like getting into fights with my advisor all the time. Not that he, he agreed with me, but I still, you know, when you're mad, you're going to find a reason to argue. Right. Um, and the understanding is, so the, these are um, the houses that were inhabited, the, the style of houses inhabited by people in the Iron Age in Britain. And we know they continue a little bit into the Roman period, but oftentimes what you see is an image like this of a city or town or a Roman villa. And then you see a picture of people around some roundhouses and the people are always kind of muddy and dirty. Um, and not, that's not to say that that's not true, but um, it's also not necessarily true, okay? Um, and we're not, we don't have time for this. So what I want you to do right now in groups, okay? <laughs> for a second, um, is to sit and talk and brainstorm about what stereotypes you have heard that you have, or not that, you know, maybe stereotypes that you've heard, but you don't ascribe to um, about the word peasant, peasant, and maybe also try to come up with some stereotypes about modern rural populations. If you know of any, are there stereotypes about modern rural people, or is this just something that exists if we think about the ancient world? Um, I'm going to give you like four minutes, five minutes. Um, see how, if you need more time, I'll give you more time.
All right, one minute, one minute warning. All right. All right, so I'm gonna solicit opinions in a second. Um, but first I just wanna like, just because it's what's on my slideshow, okay. Um, these are the things that we've kind of talked about already, but we haven't talked about this. We will in a second. Um, we have trouble reconstructing rural life because we don't have very many sources. If you remember our problem with sources, ancient rural populations may or may not have been literate. We don't know. Um, we do find graffiti from rural sites. So we think that they were more literate than we assume that they were. Um, but we don't have, yeah, graffiti on like pots and stuff. Um, uh, text. I mean, pretty simple text, like Bob's cup, like that, you know, Julius's cup. Um, but showing some sort of literacy, right? Um, although who wrote it on there, we don't know. Um, we lack socioeconomic data from the Roman world. So basic data, like how many people lived there? How old were they? How much money did they have? They did, but we don't have the data. We don't, and we don't have, so we have more information from urban centers, but we still don't have like numbers usually. There are a couple instances where we do, but not very many. Um, yes. Yeah. Although I don't know if they had them in Greece. Your son would know, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't really help. Right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think that they did. I mean, they did count the number. I know that they knew the number of the population, but I don't know if they didn't call it a census. And I don't know if it happened on the regular, the way that they did it in Rome. So that's the part. I know they know the population in, in Athens and um, other Greek cities. Um, but how many of the population had how much money? Uh, we certainly don't get that data. The Romans knew um, but because they taxed them, but we don't know. Um, and then we have biased sources from the ancient world. So where we have people talking about the rural population, they're often really, really romanticized like the, the farm boy playing his flute and watching his sheep um, sees the farm girl and they get married, like that kind of, you know, or it's something very, very negative. Um, but it's hard, and we'll talk about this next time, but it's hard to, to find uh, references that we can really trust as saying like, this is kind of very accurate. Um, and then we have some bias in the modern scholarship. And that's what I want to hear from you about in a second. Um, so, but this bias and, and the lack of information leaves us with this kind of uh, aporia is what a Greek word for not knowing nothingness in your mind. Um, we don't know who the rural population even is really. So we don't know how to imagine them. Are they mostly landlords and slaves? Do we have small farmers, tenant farmers, subsistence farmers? What does that even mean? Um, are they peasant, that's the word that gets used the most in the study of the rural population. Um, and that's kind of a loaded term, right? And that's what I wanna hear from you about what kinds of stereotypes you know of. <laughs> Here, I'm coming. We had lots of really common stereotypes, you know, starting from the Romans through Robin Hood and today. But anyway, you know, uneducated generally and poor. Mm -hmm. um, so limited housing, clothing, perhaps short lives, more insecure lives. And then we were thinking about the uh, social situation of that. They might have been exploited, underappreciated, and perhaps um, an inability to accumulate wealth and move out of the situation they were born into because those cultures were pretty stratified by who you were bred to or born to. Yeah. Um, and um, 
we talked a little bit about how that might have led to some of the folk hero sort of legends about these people breaking free of those shackles, but we assume they were sort of unshackled. And so our our kind of common focus, at least where this group went, was the Southern South and slavery, mm -hmm. where people, again, lived um, were intentionally kept uneducated. I don't know if these other people were. Um, we had more opportunity for education in the modern times, but still they weren't. And back in Roman times, communication must have been very slow and laborious, especially given what it cost to write anything. And I assume you sent it on horse by mouth or a piece of paper by bird or something. And now you've got other ways of communicating, but still, we still have that stratification of more highly educated, less educated. Some people feel it disadvantaged and trapped in their circumstances in rural communities. That's absolutely a huge consideration. And it's something, um, let me see if I have, oh. so we know that in the medieval period, so from the early middle ages um, until about AD 1300 in England and in Hungary and in France and in lots of other European uh, areas that became nation states that we know of today, but at the time our little kingdoms and duchies uh, we know that a huge portion of the population was what is called enserfed. So they belong to the land and they're they're practically they're they're slaves, but their bodies aren't saleable. Um, and for my uh, PhD research, I had to I, I wound up going all the way back to records on serfs because I was so angry. Like I because I kept saying, like, well, aren't we interested? So we know that our a lot of our stereotypes about medieval peasants come from a period in which they they actually were legally um, enslaved. And our question for the Roman period is really like, we don't know whether or not that was the case. So it may have been. And uh, there's certainly really a lot of evidence that that may have, that the insertment that happened later may have begun at the very end of the Roman period. So is the situation in the Roman period even changing? And, and what is it? That's a question that, um, I, I think you're drawing a lot of attention to this to this issue that where we have historical sources for the medieval period, but we don't know whether or not we can use them to go backwards. Although we do know the, I mean, what you're saying about transportation and education is probably true. I mean, certainly transportation is very slow. Uh, we know people can read and write. We know paper is not as expensive as vellum. So people are writing on papyrus and on wood um, in Roman Britain, and we found uh, their their documents. Um, but could farm farmers could they read and write? We know there's a lot of social mobility in Roman cities. Does that social mobility extend to the countryside? I mean, probably less so. But is there none, or is there any? Yeah. No, no. I mean. It changes over time. There's a group of people called patricians. They're wealthy and they're given uh, the ability to vote in certain circumstances um, that poor people are not able to. So those poor people are called plebeian. But um, people could move into the patrician class or the equestrian class from the plebeian class. But also people in the plebeian class had social and economic power. They could vote um, and they could get rich. And we have lots and lots of evidence, both documentary evidence and literary evidence of people starting out as slaves and becoming extremely rich. Um, so as we talked about this, I think we came up with a lot of descriptive words that everybody else would agree with. Um, one idea we wondered about was, would uh, the rural people tend to be more tribal or clannish? Again, these are stereotypical. Mm -hmm. We're trying to identify stereotypes. Of course, they all start with our understanding, but that was one. Uh -huh. uh, another was the the hierarchy that you always mentioned. They tended to be lower on whatever hierarchy existed. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks for elucidating uh, the difference between peasants and serfs, because that was one question we had, and we couldn't answer that. So, Peasants are but, like the blanket yeah. um, for Come poor probably. rural population, serfs, slaves. Dirty. Yep. Uneducated, squalor, roughly clothed. Uh-huh. 
um, physical labor, potentially shorter lifespan than urban. Again, big question mark, don't know that for a fact, but it's a stereotype, right? Mm -hmm. No schools, uh, early age of working. Uh, Self-made tools, subsistence living, mm -hmm. uh, and low in the hierarchy, whatever, however you define the hierarchy. Yeah. So like the Nazi, brutish, and short, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had most of those, but we mm -hmm. came up with some positives. Okay. We felt that they were very self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. They grew their own food. They made their tools. They made their clothing. They made what they needed. Um, they probably did make music because they didn't have much opportunity for entertainment. Uh -huh. And we thought they were probably pretty good storytellers. And that's how they shared their histories and their entertainment. And, um, and you know, don't we all some days want to run off to the UP and have that simple love? Oh, all the time. Every day. Every day. <laughs> I think a big factor in all these things is the uh, expected lifespan of of the the rural folks. Uh, yeah, I know I was impressed when traveling to the Southwest a long time ago to learn that the Papago Indians of uh, uh, the the native in, indigenous population around Tucson, uh, their life expectancy in the recorded history was about twenty six years old oh, on yeah. average, and so a lot of the diseases we think of uh, would uh, of age wouldn't have happened here. But the uh, uh, the the um, maternal and birth uh, birth mortality had to be terrifically high, uh, and all the diseases and things that would would kill you. I mean, just decimated the population uh, routinely. So, um, yeah, they wouldn't even be as old as our friends here in the in the picture, probably. So. This is well. I miss it. Um. I might talk about this again when we start class again next Thursday, because I teach a whole day of class on this every semester and actually like life expectancy and lifespan are different. So if you survived all of these things, you'd probably live to 75, but um, maternal mortality, obviously we don't know because when people started testing for it, it was women in hospitals giving birth, uh, with doctors that didn't know how to wash their, didn't know to wash their hands. So, so, but we think somewhere between like one and 35% of all pregnancies ended in the death of either the mother or the child or both. Um, and the infant mortality rate, it might be higher. Uh, the infant mortality, infant and child mortality rate was 50% by the, by the age of five, um, which is shocking. And, and that's the case yeah, well, we can talk about population dynamics in the beginning of class next time because I'll bring you a graph because it's really, really interesting and it's a hugely important thing to think about. Uh, a lot of the things everybody has talked about, we talked a little bit about each village had people who had special skills. That is, uh, all the women would have one woman who was there for births. Oh yeah. And men who could build houses were set aside or blacksmithing skills or it wasn't universal, but every little town had their own specialized skill people. <clears throat> I'm gonna respond to all of this. I'm going to say, these are all, you're saying things that are actually like a lot more sensitive, all of you, to the reality than what we find in the scholarship, okay? <laughs> because you are mentioning the stereotypes, but you're also thinking pretty deeply about what is actually necessary for people living on the land and what happens in a community um, of people that depend on one another, right? Um the scholarship on the rural population in the Roman world is quite um, simplistic and it's changing now. So since I started my PhD, it's gotten, sounds a lot more like what you're all saying and a lot less like what I'm gonna show you in a second, okay? Um, but the stuff that 
when I started my PhD, I, I was living in a little apartment with my husband um, on the corner of two major streets in Oxford. So imagine like I'm reading with ambulances going by, like, you know, all the time, all hours of the day. And I'm sitting there crying every single day for a month. I cried because I, I didn't know that people thought these things about other people, you know, like, I didn't know that people would actually publish people writing things like this um, <laughs> until I started working on my, my PhD. Um, like this, I think this is a very, very, very disrespectful thing to say. Um, or this. Irrational, lazy, um, conservative, but not never in a good way, always only in a bad way. Um, the reason for the fall of Rome is the laziness of the peasants. It's not, it's something that only a few people say, but it has been said and has been published. Yeah. Um, so are you raising your hand? Yeah. Uh-huh. Are there any red threads about where they're coming from? Yeah. And that, so we'll start class on Thursday with a little um, foray into the medieval rural economy, just for about five minutes. And we're going to say, like, most of this comes actually, um, how much time do I have right now? <laughs> All right. So um, there's somebody here from England. You know about the Enclosure Acts, right? So there's a there's a period in English history that lasts from about 1600 until about 1890, 1900. And it also happens in France and elsewhere in Europe where there's an attempt to modernize the economy. Um, and the idea starting in England is that we could get really, really rich um, if instead of farming for grain, we uh, turn our fields over to sheep. Um, because sheep, you you know, you shear that, they don't take very much oversight, um, very much work. And then you shear them and you send off their wool to the Netherlands or, you know, you also have little factories in the Cotswolds in England and elsewhere uh, that spin the wool and then make the cloth and the cloth sells for extremely, extremely high prices in the European cities, right? Um, so it would be really, really useful if these landlords could just kick all of the peasants off their land and use the land that had been used as farmland for grain for sheep. So there's a campaign um, against peasants. <laughs> uh, and it's not just a campaign to, to take them off their land. It's also like a, um, a literary campaign arguing that peasants are bad for the economy. They, uh, they sleep with each other too much. They have too many children. They're too poor. This is Thomas, so so like this goes on for such a long time that even people like Malthus, you've all heard of Malthusian economics, right? Um, he is a preacher, but he he's writing in support of people that want to kick the peasants off their own land, off their estate. And he's saying, well, peasants are lazy. They're, uh, they, they have too much sex with their wives. <laughs> uh, their, their families are too big. They're, they, they never get their work done. And if you let them run the land, um, we're just going to be impoverished forever. Um, so I'll bring you a couple slides about this. Actually, like somebody, uh, one of the overlords of Ireland in the 1800s during the potato famine said, um, only the famine and the immigration that uh, is caused by the famine will allow us to become civilized. Yeah. Um, this happens in, in most of the Western European countries. Um, and it 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 is um, one of the things that begins the study of economics. So Thomas Malthus is the father of modern economics. And he's writing these works that are economic, they're works of economics, but they're also works of um, polemical works against the, the rural population. Um, and, and that's what I think is behind some of these theories. Not that they're completely based on nothing. I mean, it's not, we're not going to say if we drive out of Holland and we, we drive through farmland, we're not going to say, oh, farmers, even in Michigan and modern America, are the richest people around. You know, we're not we're not going to say like we know that some stereotypes have their 
have some basis in reality. So if we look, and when we do look at the archeology span of the rural economy next time, we're gonna see um, there are poor farmers in the Roman world, um, but are they poor in the way that Thomas Malthus thinks that they are? Are they lazy? Are they economically irrational? Are they unengaged with the economy? Are they living a life apart? Um, I'm gonna say, you. I'll just tell you the thesis now. I'm gonna say absolutely not. Um, and I'm going to say I have all of the data that you want um, to prove that it's not true. Um, and that, I guess, we're not going quite as far as I wanted, but that's completely fine with me um, because we can just do this next time. But I want to show you just as a as a foretaste of what's to come, um, excavations that have happened in England over in 10 year period um, up until 1990. Um, I, I guess we're going to see it until 2013. But in 1990, a new law was passed in England requiring um, excavation or archaeological evaluation of all sites uh, that are to undergo any kind of development. So even if your field is changing from a horse pasture to an arable uh, field, it has to be evaluated in some way. Um, and watch for 1990. Yeah. Yeah. So the data that come from these excavations have um, not been published traditionally a lot of the time. So we call it gray literature. Um, and it was recently, a lot of it uh, gathered up and digitized in a, in a big labor hume trust uh, project. And I was able, when I started my dissertation, uh, this was just about to be published. So I was able to just use all of the new data and try to make sense of it. Um, and that's something that I'm going to be talking to you about next time. And, and we'll look at what the data show um, about different regions and how the rural population in different regions in Southern Britain uh, were working together or not. Um, and I think we'll see uh, if we don't, we're not going to be looking at the opposite picture to the medieval stereotypes, right? Where it's not like everybody is suddenly a rich entrepreneur. Um, but we're going to see a much more complicated picture than the one that I think we uh, come into this research with. And with that, I think it's exactly 11 o'clock. Um, sure. So thank you very much. Yeah. We look forward to a week from today. Yeah. You guys have been an awesome audience. Thank you. And, and participants.